Now, just checking to see if my voice is coming through OK. I think that is a yes. OK. So uh, I want to thank Duncan for uh, this initiative of organizing the seminar series. Uh, I've actually looked forward to Mondays this fall because of him. Uh, we'll definitely keep this initiative alive in years to come uh, through, through Unify. Uh, so today what I'm going to do is I'll tell you a little bit about uh, a couple of projects that we have worked on in the domain of uh, power system modeling for uh, grid forming inverters uh, over the past year or so and what we learned along the way and uh, different problems that, uh, that, that came alongside what we were initially investigating. Uh, that will end up being the more interesting part of this. All uh, right. So a quick shout out uh, to the wonderful students and research engineers that actually did all this work uh, and the papers where the details on the topics we cover are, uh, are, are housed. Uh, so results that I'm going to share with you today are uh, due entirely to uh, the hard work and creativity of uh, Olaulu Ajala at Illinois, uh, Nathan Bakeland at KU Leuven, and Venkat and Manish, uh, who are photos down here at, uh, at the University of Minnesota. Uh, the common thread here is how happy they are to work with me. Um, papers flashed on the right uh, are where these results are, are present, as I said, and they're in various stages of being rejected. Uh, but jokes apart, a few of them are published, a few are yet to appear. Uh, and uh, you know, if you want uh, to the preprints of things that you cannot find online, please uh, send me an email and, uh, and I'll pass them along. Uh, we'll also use this uh, avenue for the Zoom sermons and these Zoom seminars to see how poorly my jokes land uh, through through the rest of this uh, rest of this talk. All right. So what is this talk about? Uh, this talk is primarily about modeling and model reduction. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to overview some recent results, some tips, and some tricks to uh, reduce model complexity at uh, the inverter and the system level. Uh, we'll see how model reduction can be taken to an extreme, uh, and in so doing, we'll recover phase dynamics for the setting where different GFM uh, inverter-based resources are interconnected in, uh, frankly, uh, networks with arbitrary topologies. Uh, and these phase dynamics will align with the celebrated uh, Kuramoto oscillator dynamics. Uh, with such an equivalence uh, identified, we'll answer some very fundamental questions pertaining to when grid-forming inverters will synchronize to what frequency and under what conditions they can offer functionality, uh, like sharing power and tracking references, for instance. Uh, while undertaking this modeling effort, we encountered some key challenges and we bumped into a few open questions uh, for two tasks that were pervasive in our effort, uh, and I'm sure are so in all aspects of uh, power system uh, modeling. Uh, these two topics are per unit modeling and crone reduction. We'll focus on these in the second and third portions of the talk. Uh, but, you know, just a quick snapshot of what's lying ahead, right? Uh, per unit modeling is as ubiquitous as it's not uniform. Uh, in my mind, that's a dangerous combination. Uh, I think about the last three models that we have built per unit transcriptions for in different projects, and they were all done very differently. Uh, and that simply can't be, right? So there's, there's something really off there if you're not able to do the same thing the same way. Uh, there's a lit, uh, rich literature on per unit models for synchronous generators, but uh, frankly, several gaping holes when it comes to applying similar ideas for normalizing dynamics of power converters and for formalizing the approach in a very precise system theoretic way. Uh, we'll address these aspects in the second uh, portion of the talk. And then finally, we'll push the needle a little on crone reduction. Uh, in my mind, this is truly foundational to power system modeling. Uh, to the extent that we present an elemental version of this as star delta transforms, right, to undergrads in the second day of, uh, of an introductory course on power system analysis. Uh, the method is very well defined in the phaser domain, but we'll see that there are several open questions when we think about crone reduction uh, and crone reduced networks in the time domain. So let's take a deeper dive into models and model reduction uh, to start this talk. Uh, CEDO has funded some remarkable high-risk, high-reward projects uh, in the space of grid-forming technologies. I, I truly believe that when the history books are eventually written by Julie, folks at CEDO will go down as true visionaries for recognizing the importance of this topical space uh, and cultivating a fertile research ecosystem for it. Uh, this technology, I, in my opinion, is truly central uh, to our shared aspiration of realizing a next-generation renewable-centric grid. In this picture, I'm showing you all a snapshot of the system architecture that we are building as part of our ongoing CEDO project. It's coming together in a basement in the labs of Brian Johnson at uh, UW Seattle. Uh, and this is, in our opinion, a mock-up of a transmission and distribution future with 100% power electronics interface resources on both the source and the load sites. And we're doing this with emulated PV and storage. 
The total capacity of this network is on the order of 100 kilowatts. Uh, we are planning for about 100 plus inverters in the system, and this is going to be connected across a mock-up of the uh, IEEE 14 bus network, uh, which we will build with actual transformers, lines, and loads. Uh, the large GFMs in this case are three-level neutral point clamped inverters. At least that's what Venkat tells me they are. Uh, and then the smaller inverters are uh, off-the-shelf micro inverters from our uh, industry partner, that's uh, Enphase Energy. What I'm going to present on model reduction is going to be based on our effort in taming complexity at both nodal and network levels that's inherent in a system such as this. Uh, what we'll cover on per unit modeling and crone reduction, on the other hand, are going to be tangential offshoots that came from the main work plan of modeling the system uh, before we were able to have the confidence to set it off in hardware. So these tasks on per unit modeling and crone reduction were never really planned up front. Uh, and you know, research of this type has been a constant signature for my group over the past few years. In my opinion, it's a testament to the rich class of problems that are hiding under the rug when we are thinking of re-envisioning and re-realizing the grid with power electronics resources, and because they really do present fundamentally different uh, dynamic properties than what we've all been used to. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, on the left is a sketch of control layers at the level of individual three-phase uh, grid forming units for our current project. It's not too much of a stretch, in my opinion, to say that most published work where such control layers are revealed, uh, they appear to be organized in a similar manner. Uh, what do I mean by this? There's a primary controller, uh, an outer loop for voltage control, an inner loop for current control, uh, and then some intelligence to limit currents. There's three main types of primary controls uh, that are dominating the airwaves today. There's classical group control, which is courtesy Mukul Chandorkar and Deepak Dewan from a celebrated 93 paper. There's virtual synchronous machine control. Uh, this has an origin story that's a bit harder to nail down. And then there's virtual oscillator control, which is a relatively newer entrant, uh, merely an academic fascination at its inception, but now I think has captivated a little bit of attention across the community because of the rich dynamics that it offers. So this inner and outer loop control architecture is quite standard for voltage source converters in general. Uh, and it's discussed with uh, really exceptional clarity by Reza Irawani and uh, Amir Nasser Yazdani in a green hardcover textbook on voltage source converters that is, I hope, surely on all uh, of your shelves. Uh, I know Amir pops into these seminars every once in a while. And if he's listening, you know, a sincere request to him to introduce grid forming models in a future revision. That'll do more to bring this topic to uh, to, 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 uh, to widespread attention than, than we all can. Uh, but getting back to it, uh, it turns out that uh, while these three primary controllers exhibit very different uh, dynamic properties and dynamic performance, they can all be engineered to offer quite similar steady state performance. Uh, in fact, one can tease out a rotation angle, which I'll call psi, in all of these three types, which if you tune correctly, you can endow them with steady state droop characteristics which either trade off power versus frequency and reactive power versus voltage or the other way around. Uh, simulation results on the right are merely illustrative of this. Uh, the surfaces that are shaded in purple correspond to droop and VSM, and the surfaces shaded in orange correspond to uh, dispatchable VOC. We illustrate how different choices of psi can result in different trade-offs in steady state. Uh, and remarkably, the surfaces overlap for the different primary controls, or at least they can be engineered to do so. This is quite intriguing, since on the face of it, these primary controllers really exhibit very different dynamic performance. Uh, but clearly, there is a common kernel at the core that is universal, and that is what we will tease out as we go ahead. So for uh, power system modeling folks, the first impulse, right, when you look at a uh, complex uh, uh, subsystem such as this with many different control layers, is to really uh, tame the dynamical uh, complexity that's that's inherent. And you do this by reducing the model order. You can throw a variety of tools uh, to this task, and this spans the entire spectrum going from purely analytical to numerical. Uh, and in our effort, uh, and really I should preface this to say that by our effort, I mean Olaolu's effort, time scales of these different loops were compartmentalized by a, a participation factor analysis. And then through singular perturbation analysis, the model order was reduced to obtain the simpler model uh, that's, that's shown on the right over here. Uh, I want to point out that this reduced order model preserves structure to the extent possible. And what do I mean by this? I mean that something that looks like an inductor on the left is going to look like an inductor on the right and not like a capacitor. Okay, So it's going to maintain that structure. 
Uh, in slides to come, I'm going to use the shorthands uh, that are shown at the bottom here for uh, illustrating the full order and the reduced order inverter models. So the fewer the layers in these icons, the lower the model order. And then the color is going to distinguish the type of primary control. Blue is going to illustrate troop, red is going to show VSM, and green is going to show VOC. Uh, in this entire modeling task, the baseline effort that we had to uh, that we had to endure in obtaining a per unit transcription was significant. Uh, this required uh, admittedly very scrupulous bookkeeping of dimensions and uh, units to tease out base values. Uh, this is, or it should be anyway, a huge red flag, right? This, this it cannot involve that much effort and it has to be repeated every time a new model is, is built up. And this was frustrating enough to us to the point that it informed a whole line of research. We'll dig a lot deeper into this foundational activity and we'll propose the system theoretic solution for this uh, in, in, in the slides to come. So getting back to model reduction, here's another neat result that we stumbled along uh, the way. We know how to get reduced order models for individual grid forming inverters, but what if you had multiple grid forming inverters connected in parallel at a single bus? So it turns out that with appropriate parameterization, you can still get a reduced order structure preserving dynamic aggregate in such settings under some basic homogeneity assumptions with regard to parameters. Uh, so we won't dig a lot more into this topic except to acknowledge that dynamic aggregation is feasible and it is possible without losing information uh, under some homogeneous uh, conditions. So having outlined how to obtain uh, reduced order models at the inverter and the bus levels, we'll now move on to the next obvious step, right? We'll put it all together. Uh, we considered uh, an EMT model for networks of grid forming inverters, and the transmission lines are modeled as CDs RL circuits. And here's where things start to get interesting from the network point of view. Uh, it turns out that the well known clone reduction method that we frankly apply with generous abandon, right, in the phaser domain, can also be applied in the time domain. And this can be done for lines with any impedance angle, with the caveat that they have to have the same R over L ratio. Uh, so a quick point about notation on that front. In what follows, I'm going to denote the impedance angle of the R over L transmission lines by the Greek letter RT. Uh, so as a preview of what's to come in the third part of this talk, the requirement of identical R over L ratios was exactly the red flag that drove us to dig a little bit deeper. Um, in general, I'm always intrigued by how and why methods we take for granted in the phaser domain do or do not go through or translate well in the time domain. And so this whole business of requiring identical RL ratios to get these clone reduced network models is just one such instance where we run into this issue. But for now, let's go back to model reduction for the entire network. Uh, I'll present these ideas in the context of the 14 bus network that's sketched on the left. Uh, remember, we applied singular perturbation and dynamic aggregation at the node or the bus level, and we'll also throw time domain clone reduction at it. And what you get then is a reduced order model from both nodal and network points of view uh, that you can simulate with ease. And this is the one that's shown on the right. The table shows you the reduction in number of dynamic states and the corresponding reduction in computation time. And I believe this was for a representative run of 15 seconds that involved uh, several large signal uh, impacts. So once you start reducing the model order, right, you really can't stop. It's really hard to stop. You wanna see what's at the core of it all. So a natural question to ask then is to wonder what happens in the extreme? It turns out that uh, what you get is actually quite interesting. If you apply time domain clone reduction, you disregard dynamics for a few more time scales than the ones that we stopped at earlier. Uh, and you assume that the GFM uh, resources are all tuned so that their rotation angles that are in their primary controllers exactly match the impedance angles of the interconnecting transmission lines then what you get is a reduced order model for the phase dynamics shown in this equation tagged uh, GFM. This is all that's left. Uh, entries D sub I are actually encoding the frequency power droop behavior. This is going to be different depending on what type of GFM resource you have. Sigma sub I is encoding ratings of the GFM resources. And YR sub IJ is encoding terms that arise from the crone reduced uh, admittance matrix. Uh, what's, what's, what's coming along with this? What we have along with this is an equation tagged uh, KUR. And this is the celebrated Kuramoto phase dynamics for coupled oscillators. 
Uh, this model has been studied uh, by numerous researchers across diverse disciplines, spanning mathematics, physics, neuroscience, engineering, among others, for well over five decades. Uh, and in this model, you have omega sub s denoting the natural frequency of oscillation, a sub i j denoting coupling strengths between the phases, and omega i is the actual frequency of each uh, of each of these oscillators. And then the picture on the right is showing you a mechanical analog that illustrates uh, the Kuramoto dynamics. So it's quite clear that the reduced order GFM dynamics and the Kuramoto dynamics have the same structure. So if you focus on the parametric equivalences that we identify in the last equation, you'll see why this is. Whatever you can say about the Kuramoto model with parameters that are highlighted in orange, you can now infer about the grid forming interconnected model with the parameters highlighted in red. And it turns out that a lot has been said about Kuramoto models in the literature. All we have to do is to contextualize those results and apply them to learn a little bit more about interconnected GFM dynamics. So what can we learn about the dynamics of interconnected uh, GFM IBRs of very many different types. So with the equivalences highlighted previously, we can now answer simple yet profound, uh, what is the meaning of life? Are we alone in the universe type questions, right? We simply cannot answer questions of this sort with certainty and clarity when contending with the complexity that was inherent in those higher order models. Uh, and on this slide, I'm listing three things that come to light. They're organized in a decreasing order of importance in terms of what would be deemed desirable performance in power networks. Uh, what do I mean by this? It would be fundamentally important to have synchronization, right? We can all agree on that. It would be nice to have power sharing. And in addition, if we can certify that they are tracking references, that would be an added bonus. Uh, interestingly, this order is also representative of the ease by which they can be satisfied in practice. Uh, what do I mean by this? One is very easy to satisfy, two is a bit harder, and then three is only possible under uh, fairly delicately balanced uh, conditions. So let's take a look at synchronization. Uh, we can obtain conditions for existence and uniqueness of synchronized solutions in these networks of GFM IBRs. And we can answer questions like when GFM IBRs will synchronize and to what frequency. Uh, the equation tagged omega provides a closed form expression for the synchronization frequency omega sub sin. This is offset from the electrical radiance synchronous frequency omega s, and this would be 2 pi 60, 2 pi 50 radians per second. Uh, and that offset is captured by this term delta omega. Uh, if you stare at delta omega, you'll see that it depends on a weighted sum of power set points. These are the terms P star uh, and Q star, as well as the transmission line impedance angle, this quantity var phi. Uh, and then you'll see that if the references sum up in a very particular way to zero, and we term this condition as balanced, there is no frequency offset and everything is synchronized to the electrical radiance synchronous frequency. Let's move on to power sharing. If you have a synchronized solution, and this doesn't necessarily have to be at the nominal or the uh, uh, electrical radiance synchronous frequency omega s, and if you make that further effort of tuning the steady state group characteristics of the different GFM IBRs to coincide, and we saw an instance of how you can do this in a few slides before, what you get is power sharing, okay? And then finally, we consider this idealized reference tracking uh, scenario. So in several of our internal deliberations, you know, Deepak Diwan has frequently brought up the issue of how do you validate or how do you certify that IBRs are actually doing what they are set out to do? Uh, and here's one small piece of answering that question. You can guarantee that references will be tracked uh, in other words, that real and reactive power outputs of the GFMs will coincide with their commanded references in some of these extreme edge cases for resistive networks, inductive networks, if the references and a system level are balanced, right? So you have to have the system level property to guarantee something at the nodal level. And so this only happens if the synchronization frequency is equal to nominal and not otherwise. So I want to acknowledge some brilliant work, right? That has paved the way for us to discover these inferences. Uh, Francesco Bulo at the University of California in sunny Santa Barbara, uh, equal parts brilliant, polished, and generous, uh, along with two exceptional former students, uh, Florian Dorfler, who is now at ETH in Zurich, uh, and John Simpson Porco, who is at uh, UToronto, have derived some cutting edge results in power system dynamics in the past decade that we should all really be aware of. Uh, the mugshots in the middle show you Florian in Santa Barbara and Florian in ETH. I'll let you make your own conclusions on, uh, on what happened or what went wrong. Uh, but in any case, in 2009, 
Uh, Florian and Francesco made the startling observation of the equivalence between synchronous generator dynamics and the dynamics of the celebrated Kuramoto model. Uh, in 2012, the three published an equally intriguing paper where they showed that group controlled inverters connected in parallel actually exhibit these Kuramoto type dynamics. So we are simply standing on the shoulders of these giants and extending their results to learn a little bit more about GFM IBRs that are connected in much more complex settings and have many, many different other types of primary control dynamics. So it uh, turns out that Francesco calls the Center for Control Dynamical Systems and Computation, or CCDC for short, uh, at UCSB to be his home. Uh, this center uh, really has, you know, whether you know it or not, influenced power system dynamics, modeling, and control in so many different ways over the years since its inception in 91. Francesco's contributions are just one instance of many. Today, while researchers in the center are still at the cutting edge of contributions in control theory and dynamical systems, they're not that heavily invested in power systems. But having said that, if you take a close look at their logo, unless I'm missing something, that to me looks like a mechanical governor for a synchronous generator, okay? And you really have to wonder why this is. Uh, it turns out that the CCDC at Santa Barbara was founded by one Peter Kokodovich, uh, who moved there from Illinois in 91. Uh, Kokodovich was the one that popularized the application of singular perturbation for model reduction of synchronous generator dynamics. And he did this uh, in collaboration with Pete Sauer while they were both at Illinois. Uh, and when Kokodovich eventually moved to CCDC and established the center, that probably had something to do with the governor sneaking into the logo. It's never quite left. Uh, the other interesting thing is the other day, Alejandro sent me a picture of a copy of Nathan Cohn's book that's super hard to get a hold of. And on the inside, there is a note uh, from Nathan Cohn to Kokotovich dating back to the Allerton Conference in 1971. This is an annual conference that's held by the University of Illinois in a remarkably hard to get to retreat center in Monticello, Illinois. It's heartening to imagine a meeting between Cohn and Kokotovich, titans in industry and academia. What's more mind boggling to me, at least, is the fact that Nathan Cohn gave a copy of his book to Kokodovich, right? So that's coming from industry to academia and not the other way around. Very fascinating. So a quick check on where we are at and where we're headed. So we've looked at methods to reduce model complexity at uh, nodal and network levels for grid forming inverter-based resources. And in the extreme, we recovered this Kuramoto type dynamics that helped us answer some very fundamental questions. Along the way, I indicated that there were two stumbling blocks. One was on per unit modeling and the other one was on prone reduction in this very specific case where the R over L ratios of transmission lines are not all the same. And we'll take a deeper dive into both of these. We'll start with per unit models. So the convention in per unit modeling is to use this very familiar formula that's at the very top of this slide. Uh, and we use this to evaluate per unit quantities. Uh, we define a set of base values for certain primary value quantities, such as power, voltage, and frequency. Uh, and then we define base values for some auxiliary quantities that we need in order to evaluate uh, per unit numbers. Uh, and then we finally take our parameters and then we normalize them to get per unit quantities. So this algorithmic stepwise procedure, one, two, and three, it's done with varying levels of effort, but it's done uniformly for physical and control layers, for parameters and state variables, and for both dynamic and steady state models. So what is the problem? Uh, the problem arises when you start looking a little bit into power converters and you try to apply this stepwise uh, in, uh, algorithmic procedure to that context. Uh, so let's take a, uh, an example of a grid following inverter model to illustrate this challenge, okay? So this model that I'm showing you on the right includes a first order L filter. It's a simple PI based current controller. Uh, and then there's also a synchronous reference frame uh, phase lock loop or an SRF PLL for short, which synchronizes it with the grid. It's quite easy to apply this algorithmic procedure on the left to normalize parameters in the power stage. However, the minute you get into the control layer, things get very challenging. The parameters here are controller gains and the units for such gains are very far from standard. For instance, if you look at the Ki gain in the current controller, it has units of padded inverse. The Ki gain of the PLL has units of radians per Weber per second. How do you even systematically tease out base values for such control gains? Where are these base values going to come from? Uh, are they going to come from the base values that we use you know, with, without thinking about it twice in the power stage? Probably not. It's also not very clear how this whole procedure can be done as you increase the number of control loops with the parameters increasing and more exotic units uh, creeping in uh, in terms of bookkeeping. So that's not the only problem with this conventional procedure, right? Several other questions and ambiguities come up as well. For instance, 
what system theoretic properties of the SI model will the per unit model acquire? For instance, will the eigenvalues remain the same or will they be different? Are per unit models unique? On and on we can go about posing these such types of questions. And my contention is that, uh, is that the conventional algorithmic procedure that we all take for granted cannot answer such system theoretic questions because it is at the, at the heart of it model specific. So as a result of this direct consequence, right? So elementary properties of per unit models as they relate to those originating SI models have been very difficult to, uh, to, to tease out. And it's not just us that we ran into this, uh, uh, you know, when we were dealing with this in the context of our converters. This problem with the conventional procedure has actually been recognized through the ages. Uh, if you do a literature review on per unit in IEEE Explore, just those two keywords, nothing else, and I like to do this for any topic that I'm working on, you'll discover that the first material on the topic is really a brilliantly written paper in 1937 by one Irwin Travis. And in it, he says, and I'll quote him, it's not at all obvious that the per unit quantities will satisfy the same equations as the ones that they were derived from. In fact, they won't unless the bases are chosen in a particular manner. Similarly, Professor Kundur in his famous textbook on power system stability and control says, uh, you know, he, he, he tells you about the virtues of per unit modeling. He says, you know, it can minimize computational effort, simplify evaluation and so on and so forth. But then he says, some base quantities may be chosen independently and quite arbitrarily, while others follow automatically. So this very clearly betrays a sense of confusion about the process in general, right? So is it particular or is it arbitrary? Which base quantity should follow automatically, right? So on and on we can go about this uh, as well. We'll also take a step back uh, and look at the bigger picture from a network simulation point of view. Uh, with due apologies to the power system, uh, to the, uh, sorry, the positive sequence modeling crowd, uh, I'm going to consider the ground truth as that established by a lumped parameter ODE model, okay? And all variables and parameters in this model are going to be represented in SI units. That's my ground truth, okay? Uh, DAE and phaser models that are, uh, you know, frequently used are indeed approximations. They invoke frequency dependent per unit network parameters like reactances. And without questioning the validity of these approximations and what the approximation errors are or could be, it really should bother us that there is a gap between these two classes of models and it's not addressed in a very rigorous way in the literature. So the procedure that I'll outline for per unit modeling will actually reveal a normalized time domain model that neatly fills this gap. Uh, all signals will be normalized, transformers will vanish, and yet all of this will be achieved without leaning on fixed frequency assumptions at either the network or the nodal levels. So let's take a look at what we are offering for per unit modeling. Uh, I'll discuss this in a very system theoretic uh, uh, framework. So uh, it, uh, to, to start with, we look at what are the interfaces that we are trying to model, right? And it turns out that the dynamics of typical power conversion interfaces, whether they're converters, inverters, machines, generators, they can all be expressed in this control affine form shown in this equation tagged SI on the right. Um, this model is written with all variables and parameters expressed in SI units, okay? Nonlinearities in these models typically stem from aspects like, you know, trigonometric terms that capture spatial effects or reference frame transformations. Uh, but a common theme is that most uh, of these models are linear in terms of how control signals feed in. Bottom line, this control affine model is a great starting point and it provides a broad umbrella to model a variety of energy conversion interfaces that we would typically deal with. So next, what we're gonna do is we'll define some vectors, small x and small u, and these are normalized or per unit values of the states and inputs, okay, which were the capital X and capital U. And this relationship is captured by these transformation matrices between the two sets, okay, Tx and Tu. These are diagonal matrices that stack up the base values for the states and inputs along the main diagonal. So then we can obtain the dynamics for small x and small u. These are reported in the equation tagged Pu. And interestingly, the vector fields small f and small g that drive these per unit dynamics have the same structure as capital F and G, since these matrices Tx and Tu are diagonal. We'll see that this significantly simplifies model synthesis. Uh, we'll note that this approach is a 180 degree departure from convention, right? Because we haven't explicitly normalized parameters, we have normalized systems. The implicit understanding is that the model tag PU will automatically reveal the parameters for a per unit transcription. And we'll see this aspect in play uh, shortly as well. 
Finally, I want to mention that while the model tag PU is normalized, by which I mean that small x and small u take values normalized with respect to xb and ub, it's not dimensionless. And to appreciate this, you can quickly see that the dimensions of dx dt, for instance, are second inverse, which immediately tells you that the entries of f of x and g of x have units of uh, second inverse as well. Now, it is possible to get an entirely dimensionless and normalized system by normalizing time. And this is shown in the last equation on the slide. We won't dwell on this too much, but we'll see that this frequency base, this quantity omega sub b that you use to normalize time, has an important role to play in establishing the connection between the ODE dynamics on the left and the DAE and phasor dynamics on the right that we looked at uh, a couple of slides back. So let's take a look at this method in action. Okay? Shown in these figures are schematics for a grid-following inverter-based resource with a synchronous reference frame PLL on the left uh, and a grid-forming inverter-based resource with group control on the right. Uh, all these parameters and control gains that I show uh, and you know the control gains are shown uh, alongside these shaded triangular blocks. These are all in SI units. Um, here I'll show you the corresponding per unit transcription. Signals that are in per unit are enclosed in square brackets and they lie alongside their corresponding SI unit signals. Okay, these are all normalized. Uh, parametric scalings are also captured alongside these original SI unit parameters and these are in shaded red and blue. And a few points are worth emphasizing. Number one, Parameters are inferred. They're not calculated a priori. They emerge from the process and they don't drive the process itself. Number two, base values of control signals can actually be set quite arbitrarily without affecting the physical layer signals, which might actually carry more deliberate meaning because of device ratings. One easy choice, for instance, is to set the base values of all control signals universally to unity and the modeling effort just goes through. It's also easy to implement such a scheme in simulation packages because the structure is preserved across both SI and per unit models. This takes us to the last point as well, which is to say that when you build up system level models for large networks, you can do this in a very constructive bottom-up way. Um, all you have to do is to just exercise a little bit of caution to make sure that base values for shared uh, signals and inputs are going to be the same. And this is quite common to what we do in the phasor domain as well. We look at a few system theoretic properties that you can now rigorously establish as a result of this process. And the first one is that eigenvalues of the linearized dynamics of the original SI model uh, are going to be the same as those of the per unit model. This is true for all operating conditions. This is a critical result in my opinion, since per unit models are frequently leveraged to get an idea for relative magnitudes of parameters and setting up model reduction. Okay, and we'll see a quick glimpse at the, at the, at the proof for this result in a second. It's quite elementary. Next, we've shown how this procedure adopted for per unit modeling yields models, which have the same structure as the originating SI model. And this is because the transformation matrices are diagonal. This is tremendously helpful in synthesizing the per unit models because only the parameters have to be scaled. They all stay in place. You just have to scale them uh, with the procedure that we've identified. You can also show, for instance, that the change of base operation can be set up as just another uh, uh, transformation. Okay, this just transcribes an older per unit system to a newer per unit system without actually referring to SI values. The key point here, again, is I'm not dealing with parameters. I'm dealing with the system as a whole. We'll take a quick look at why the eigenvalues match. And this will set us up for examining linear systems uh, in a second. Shown in the first bullet here are linearized dynamics of the SI model and the corresponding Jacobian matrix, capital AEQ. And then the Jacobian of the linearized per unit model is shown by small AEQ. Uh, so leveraging the relationships between small f and capital F, small g, and capital G, uh, and a bag of tricks from linear algebra, you can actually establish that small AEQ and capital AEQ are related through a similarity transform. Okay, And as a result, they share eigenvalues. So this takes us well into linear systems. Okay, you can repeat the same process for linear systems, uh, models for power transformers, uh, potential and current transformers, RLC banks. You know, these are all linear if you disregard saturation and hysteresis effects. And the SI model state equation in this case is given by the one that's tagged SI. X dot is AX plus BU. You can apply the same procedure to get the per unit model tagged PU. And in this case, you'll, it's readily evident that the small A and the capital A matrices are related directly through a similarity transform. So all inferences and properties that we established for the nonlinear setting carry over to the linear case as well. Uh, but in addition, it turns out that we can see a little more. Uh, for instance, you can conclusively say that the per unit model obtained is a unique uh, in a rigorous and well-defined sense that no other model is going to give you the desired scaling of state variables when excited by the same set of scaled inputs. 
You can also say a little bit about transfer functions. Uh, you can say that the transfer functions in the per unit models are scaled versions of those in the SI model, and that scaling is captured by the formula shown in the box in the middle. This is indeed a very important property to bear in mind the next time you're thinking about doing controller design and synthesis and tuning it in the frequency domain with per unit models, okay? that there is a scaling that you have to keep in mind. And then finally, we are able to derive some conventional phasor domain uh, per unit models for the linear setting as a special case. And we'll look at this in just a little bit of detail in the next slide. So while motivating these per unit models, I talked about two ends of the spectrum, right? That are widely studied in the literature, SI unit, ODE models, and phasor domain, let's say algebraic uh, models. These are shown for an RLC circuit and a single phase transformer on the very extremes of the slide uh, in boxes that are shaded red. Now, indeed, there is something in the middle. And this is our per unit dynamic model, which is obtained from that SI model by normalizing state variables and inputs. Uh, you'll note that the per unit dynamic model for the transformer does not include an ideal transformer, as would be the case with a conventional per unit phasor model for a transformer. The process of uh, deriving this uh, per unit model with the choice of voltage and current base values indeed renders that ideal transformer to be transparent, even in this particular setting in the time domain. Interestingly, the parameters in these per unit models in the middle may not all be dimensionless, but we have hinted at this as well. For instance, if you look at this RLC circuit, uh, small l and small c, they actually have units of seconds, okay? They actually have units of seconds. But in any case, we can now rigorously go from the SI model on the left to the algebraic phasor model on the right. And we do this by searching for solutions uh, to this dynamic uh, phasor domain per unit model that are at synchronous electrical radiant frequency. And we'd actually have to do it for the time normalized per unit dynamical model. So there is that additional step of setting up a base frequency uh, and this has to match the synchronous electrical radiant frequency at which you're defining the phasors. And what this allows you to do then is to rigorously translate all parameters to be dimensionless, and you exactly recover conventional algebraic phasor models that we all take for granted uh, for synchronous operation on the right. So I'll end by briefly reviewing some EMT simulations here. On the left, I'm showing you a modified 37 bus network, uh, three transformers labeled T1 through 3, several GFL and GFM inverters, RLC loads, and they are all interconnected by uh, RL circuits uh, for lines. And we measure and report voltage and current at three transformer buses and frequencies at two uh, inverter buses. We run a two and a half second simulation in MATLAB, set point changes are implemented, we island the network at some instant of time, and you show results from uh, two sets of simulations. One is for the SI model and one for the per unit model. And the match is not surprising, but really, you have to do things like this to keep uh, to keep reviewers happy. All right, so I'll close out this section of the talk by pointing out what we've learned, right? So we've looked at a procedure for per unit modeling that's rigorous. It's grounded in a system theoretic construct. We've seen it as constructive, by which I mean that you can scale from small units to big networks with ease. And then we've seen that it generalizes analysis for linear and nonlinear systems across time scales in a very unified manner. Lots of avenues for future work uh, that cover implementation. Uh, but we won't jump into that. What we will jump into, though, is the final frontier for this presentation. All right, We're going to look at a neat little result on time domain prone reduction. I'll remind you where we came across this. We came across this when we were looking at that giant IEEE 14 bus network, and we said we could apply time domain prone reduction with the caveat that the RL lines uh, have to have the same uh, R over L ratio. OK, so what exactly are we moving the needle on? So to appreciate this in context, we'll first consider what is the state of the art in prone reduction in both phasor and in time domains. The first figure on the left is the familiar star delta transform, and this indeed is an elemental instance of Crohn reduction. Uh, the equivalence here is defined based on satisfying Ohm's laws and KCL and KVL on nodal sinusoidal voltages and currents that are represented as phasors. So while we leverage uh, this star delta transform to illustrate the idea here, you can actually eliminate zero injection nodes for phasor models and many, many more complex networks as well. So what happens if you now think about uh, time domain uh, crone reduction? What, what happens if you allow these nodal voltages and currents to be non-sinusoidal, to be arbitrary signals in the time domain? So it turns out that the reduced model, which is now shown in the right, uh, is still going to give you uh, uh, the, the, the capacity to go from, let's say, Y networks to delta networks, right? Eliminate these nodes. It's still going to preserve the equivalence, but it will only do this for purely resistive inductive and homogeneous circuits. And by homogeneous circuits, I mean ones where you have a constant R over L ratio. The question that we are trying to answer is what happens if the R over L ratios are not all identical? 
will show that for this general case, you can actually obtain a reduced order model. And the structure that it takes is a set of independent RL, uh, sorry, RL circuits. And these are going to be actuated by a linear combination of nodal voltages that remain. And we'll see how this shakes out. Uh, but before we do that, I want to keep up the theme of paying homage to the people that got us here. Okay, so here's Gabriel Krohn, the Krohn and Krohn reduction. By all accounts, he's a he was a brilliant mathematician and electrical engineer. Born in Hungary in tough times, he spent most of his career in General Electric in the US. Uh, Krohn was definitely sure of himself, uh, signing off as uh, Gabby or Gabe, I can't quite figure it out, uh, in a textbook in 1942 that eventually found its way to me via Bruce Wallenberg. Uh, Krohn says in no uncertain terms that he's providing a preview of engineering of the coming centuries. I guess he was right. Here we are talking about Krohn reduction in 2021. All right. So to establish notation and uh, background, what I'm going to do is consider a network with uh, capital E edges. These are all going to be RL circuits. And the topology is going to be captured by this incidence matrix, uh, capital A. Uh, and we're all familiar with this equation, I is equal to YV, where I and V are complex vectors for these N network nodes. Y is the admittance matrix uh, that's obtained from these diagonal matrices R and L, which capture all the line resistances and inductances uh, through this incidence matrix A. So if this network has n not zero current injection nodes, you can obtain a reduced equation that only relates I1 and V1, which are current injections and terminal voltages for the nodes with non-zero injections. And this reduced admittance matrix, this Y sub R, is obtained as a, as a result of a sure complement, and it is describing the equivalent Krohn reduced network. Now, if you intend to repeat this analysis in the time domain, you cannot start with I is equal to YV you have to explicitly model the RL line dynamics. And that's what we'll do in a second. So what we'll do is we'll denote the line current flows with F and we'll now emphasize that V of T, F of T, I of T, these are all time domain real valued signals. Okay, so, and we are starting with these line dynamics that are expressed in the first bullet. As we've hinted before, uh, Krohn reduction can be carried out in the time domain for homogeneous networks, where these diagonal matrices that capture line resistances and inductances are related as R is equal to alpha times L, alpha being a fixed scalar. So trivially, I want to point out that this homogeneous network assumption clearly captures purely resistive and inductive networks, right? We've seen this as well. But how does this wall work? So using KCL, you can express the current injections as A transpose the flows, okay? And then you can partition the dynamical equation and arrive at a form that's similar to what you get in the phasor domain. Uh, you can then eliminate the voltages V naught which were voltages for the zero injection nodes. And then you'll obtain a reduced equivalent model for line dynamics in what remains, which are the current injections I1 and voltages V1. For the reduced order network, you can, uh, what we've done is we've represented this network Laplacian. Uh, it's weighted by this uh, inductance matrix L and we have this matrix L tilde that sort of captures all of this. Uh, the Schur complement of L tilde actually shows up in the line dynamics. And this is very reminiscent of the Schur complement of the admittance matrix that shows up in the phasor domain. And we'll see this coming to light uh, as we go ahead. So this development in the time domain was actually only recently established. It was done by one Sina Kaliskin and uh, Professor Paolo Tavawada at uh, UCLA in 2014. Uh, a reminder though of what we are after, right? So while the kaliskin tabuada result that's shown here does bring Krohn reduction into the time domain, it only does so for homogeneous networks with identical R over L ratios. We want to generalize this analysis for networks where the resistance to inductance ratios could indeed be arbitrary. So here's one way to do this. Uh, as before, we are going to begin with the RL line dynamics. We'll partition the A matrix and we'll translate the information of zero injection nodes and form linear constraints on current flows. This is this equation A0 transpose F0. What we get is basically a DAE system with E differential equations and N0 algebraic constraints, N0 being the number of uh, zero injection nodes. So it's clear that you only have E minus N naught independent flows, and that's what we are after. We can extract these independent flows, and what the way we'll extract them is we'll project these flows F from the original circuit, from the original network, onto the range space of a matrix P, and F hat in this case will denote a set of pseudo flows that are indeed independent. So while this matrix P is not unique, you can actually infer several properties about it. Uh, for instance, its columns are clearly linearly independent. It has to be by construction. It will also satisfy the constraint uh, that A, A naught transpose P is zero, and that derives from the constraint on nodal uh, injections being zero on the subset nodes uh, uh, N naught. 
And then introducing T allows you to then write the line dynamics for these E minus N naught linearly independent ODEs. And you, it takes the form that's shown at the very bottom of the screen. So what could be a good choice for P? It turns out for, that, for instance, you can use a generalized eigenvalue decomposition to choose P in such a manner that the reduced model has diagonal L hat and R hat matrices. And so this choice gives us a decoupled RL circuit interpretation. And the last term on the RHS then shows up as a linear combination of voltages in V1. And this is what is tried to, uh, that uh, this is what we have tried to illustrate uh, in the figure on the right. So this all sounds great. Uh, but is it compatible with phasor domain clone reduction, right? And what uh, and, and and what we know about clone reduction for homogeneous networks with identical R over L uh, ratios, and we'll we'll get to that uh, next. And that's what I'm going to end with. So for all the time domain quantities in our generalized reduced order model, if we substitute the steady state phasor representation, what you're going to get is an equation that relates I1 and V1 that are now complex valued phasors, and this is shown in the first bullet uh, in the box on the left. Similarly, if you substitute R is equal to alpha L in the dynamics that we had, you will um, and, and also allow these quantities I and V to be time domain signals, you'll get this ODE in I1 and V1, and that's reported in the first bullet in the box on the right. At first glance, it's quite unclear how we can align these algebraic expressions and these differential equations that we get from our approach with the cases that we know already, which are due to Crohn and due to Kaliskin and Tabuada. To restore harmony, what we really need is these maroon uh, p dependent quantities to be equal to these unique Laplacians that we obtained from sure complements in the classical approaches. And surprisingly, this actually does hold. You can show that for all valid p matrices and arbitrary non-zero edge weights that you might collect in this diagonal matrix uh, capital W, we have a lemma here that establishes a correspondence of the seemingly complex product of matrices A1, P, and W with a sure complement. And then if you instantiate W suitably, you will actually get the desired equality for the two special cases, one in the phasor domain and one uh, in the time domain for the homogeneous network, hence aligning what we have with what's been uh, proposed in the past. So, all right, we are revisiting this outline one last time as I close out the stock uh, with this discussion on, on time domain clone reduction. What I did was I presented a projection-based method uh, to fill a gap that in my opinion was left wide open in the case where lines don't always have the same R over L ratios. And in special cases, we recovered what's known in the literature. We anticipate this result helping us expand settings where Crohn reduction is applied, uh, especially for analysis. We saw one instance of this, for instance, when we derived uh, the Kuramoto model for the IBR dynamics. So I'm gonna conclude by offering uh, some parting thoughts. Okay, And I'm gonna do this by laying it out alongside the time scales of operation uh, different modeling paradigms and timescales at which we anticipate uh, actuating control uh, as part of uh, what we will do through Unify. Uh, as we ponder on a grid that's going to be dominated by power electronics, I do believe it is imperative to question concepts and paradigms that we hold sacrosanct from our experience of modeling the grid of the past. Uh, indeed, irrespective of whether we examine ontological or methodological uh, concepts, uh, questions will find frequently dominate answers. Okay, several notions such as inertia, such as frequency, may frankly be rendered irrelevant before we even know it. And methods we treasure and we are familiar with will have to be revisited and realigned uh, with our brave new world. So how do we go about doing this? A few realizations on this front. For instance, I don't think we can standardize models across the board to the extent we were able to do so with synchronous generators. That said, I believe that we should be able to standardize modeling itself. We'll have to disconnect from our obsession of phasers to cut across timescales that are of relevance in the context of power converter dynamics. We'll have to fill gaps uh, with, uh, and, 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 and address and challenge our long-standing assumptions uh, that, that we've all held near and dear. And I do believe that there's no better time to do this uh, than now and no better group uh, to do this than the one that's assembled here. So with that, I'll end uh, and we can move on to, uh, to Q&A. Thank you so much.